Well, let's, let's pray. Our Father and our God, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And Lord, what, what a great thing it is to know that you love us, that you care for us, that you think of us, that your thoughts of us are like the sand of the seashore, that you think of us constantly and always. And because you are so big, you're able to think of all of us. Lord, I'm so grateful for that. And for the demonstration of your love by sending your own son, whom we crucified. Lord, I thank you for your grace. Thank you that you saw we had a problem that we could never fix, that we were broken and we needed healing, that we were lost and you came and found us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you did when you were here and for all that you're doing now. As your word says that you intercede for us. I pray that you might, Lord, pour out your spirit on us today as we look at your word, as we look at your careful instruction given to those who have gone on before us, that we might learn, that we might become more like you, that it might fashion and mold us into your image Lord, that you would protect us from the evil one, from distraction. Pray that you might help us to give attention to your word as it deserves. I pray that you help us in our hearts and our minds, that we would hear your voice, that you would speak to each one of us individually the thing in which we need to hear. So, Lord, we consecrate ourselves to you this morning in this place and this time. We pray that you have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we're back in chapter five of first Peter today. Um, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We're, we're given a warning that we do have an enemy. Not everything is uh, yellow brick road, but we do have an enemy and we should be on guard against him. Well, previously we were in chapter five, uh, but before that we were in chapter four. Paul, uh, Peter writing to us in chapter four, verse 17 says, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Not one of those comforting passages. And if it begins with us first, then what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? There's, I believe it's a time for the sifting of the church. Amen where he comes into our lives and says, you know, there's some things that are not yet done that need to be done personally in our lives. And um, I'm sure something flew into your mind as soon as I said that. There are things yet to be done. And so if it's going to happen with us, what's going to happen to the people who don't obey the gospel of God? How far are they going to be? And how much hope do we have that God will actually change the hearts of people? And of course, our hope comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from the White House. I'm glad you agree. So we're back in 1 Peter chapter 5, looking at what we looked at, being humble, being watchful, and being grateful. So to the elders, Peter writes, and he says that you should shepherd the flock of God that is among you. So those of us who are elders take that responsibly. But then this word elders is presbyteros, which is those who have gray hair. You know, those of us who are a little bit older, a little further down the road, we have an obligation to those who are younger, who don't know, right? And it's so easy to blame those who are younger for not getting something right. But did we teach them? I can be critical of my son that he doesn't know how to use a power saw, but did I ever show him how? He knows how to use a power saw. <laughs> but that's what we're to do. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. And he's talking to them as one who is like them. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. An overseer is one who oversees, like a manager. And the way it's supposed to be done is through serving. Now, how many of you would like a boss who serves you? And we have a God who serves us. Jesus Christ came into human flesh. God in, incarnate came into human flesh and lived a perfect love, a perfect life and showed us how to love. And then we killed him. 
because we couldn't, we couldn't look at perfection, we as human beings. And so what, what a beautiful example that Jesus is as he comes and he serves and he's patient and loving with us every day. And I'm so grateful for that. So we remember when Peter was told to feed the sheep and to tend the lambs in John chapter 21. Uh, so Peter is handing that off as a baton to others, but he is just a fellow elder like the rest of us. And I love that, that there's no separation between the, the laity, which is the, the people of the church, and those who are in authority, that we're all of one. And shepherding involves caring for sheep. Now, if you're a shepherd, what, what you don't do is beat the sheep, right? And you also don't drive the sheep. You, you can drive cattle. You know, you get a cowboy hat and a horse and yeah, and you drive cattle, right? But you don't do that with sheep. You lead sheep and sheep follow. And Jesus explains that. And he says, you know, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they won't follow another. And so what a shepherd does is lead. And one of the things you need to do is lead by example, right? If you're a Christian and people around you know it, I'm glad for that. That's stage one. Stage two is that you're an example of Christ likeness to them. That's a little bit harder to do, isn't it? Especially with the people that are closer to you and they see when you, you know, do, do, do bizarre things and hurt yourself and, you know, suddenly there's a temptation for things to fly out of your mouth. Maybe not, maybe not you good people. <laughs> Shepherding as an overseer means serving, which means I'm always mindful that my actions, my reactions, the way I spend my time, not only is it an expression of my relationship with God, but it's an expression of me taking seriously God's call in my life to take care of other people. And so there's this sense in which you don't want to pretend to be something you're not because that's called being a hypocrite, right? But you want to be the best version of yourself and you certainly don't want to mess up an opportunity to demonstrate Christ to people. Amen? Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page. So we're, we're like sheepdogs. I, I like to think of myself as an under shepherd, like a sheepdog. The ways that it's supposed to be done is willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. That when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So we're to be examples as, as the elders of the church and as those who are older. We're to shepherd and not do things under c compulsion, not to be like someone has a gun to your head, but do it willingly, eagerly. And so all of those things are, that's kind of a high bar to hit, isn't it? Now, imagine you're going into work and you put all these things into practice. I'm going in on Monday, not because I have to, because I want to. Work on that. <laughs> Not for money. Well, why else would you go to work? Do, do you think I came up here because I enjoy my job or I love you people? Yes. Oh, come on. It's, it's my career in high finance that I'm really going for up here. But see, if you don't, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. You've heard that? Yes. And there's a sense in which when you're serving the Lord and you're doing that which he's called you to do, the money is secondary. It's not primary. It's not the most important thing. In fact, there are people that work for no money because they love it. And that's the beautiful thing about retirement. A lot of people look forward to retirement so they can actually do something they want to do instead of doing something they have to do. And Oh, I heard, I heard that. There's agreement. I'm so glad. And it, the way it's done is to be as a servant. And we're to be examples to those people that are around us. And bearing the name of Christian, that's, that's a big responsibility. Um, I think people have watered down that term. And, you know, if you're not a Muslim and you're not a, a Hindu, I guess you're a Christian. But that's not the case. Being a Christian is to be a little Christ. It means I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I do those things that he says. Not just that I claim him as my savior. I show him and demonstrate by what I do. And so Jesus is the greatest shepherd who shows us how to live. And we closed that out last week. And then he says, verse five, likewise, you younger people submit yourself to your elders. 
We've seen him before explain submitting to the authorities that are over you, submitting to government. Wives, submit to your husbands. We've seen him say submission as slaves to masters. And now he's talking about younger people to the elders, to the olders who are in the church. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. That's a nice thing, isn't it? So not, not only are you to submit to your elders, you're supposed to submit to one another. That means everybody. That means I have to submit to you. <gasps> That's true. And sometimes I submit to my wife. I'm just trying to create some controversy. That's all. <laughs> because it says submit to one another. Be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Not taking something that's not yours. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him before, because he cares for you. You know, submitting to, to somebody and being humble is something that we in and of ourselves in our own strength don't want to do, and we don't do it well when we do. But when we're led by the Spirit of God and we're willing for him to have his life lived through us, it becomes a beautiful thing. And, and what a wonderful thing it is to demonstrate that to the world because it, it shows people that you're really his because you can't do that in the flesh. So submitting to one another and casting your cares on him, he tells us to be watchful. We went over this last week, to be sober, to watch and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We have an enemy, and he will use the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the, the pride of life. He will use all of those things against us to get us to trip up. And you may not see uh, spiritual beings before your very eyes, but be assured they're at work, and they're trying to work on you. Um, now that we have the lovely internet, I've, I've found things on Facebook. I'm just, I'm blowing through Facebook looking for something and some horrible bit of pornography comes flying up out of nowhere. I thought they had protections against us. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing. So the devil is always going to be influencing, always back behind the scenes, always trying to trip you up as a Christian. If he can shut you up, and keep you quiet, that's about the best he can do. If he can get you to trip up and be a bad example, that's about the best he can do. Because you know what? He can't take away your relationship with Jesus. Amen. He can tempt you and interrupt your intimacy with Christ, but what he can't do is take your salvation. It doesn't belong to him. In fact, it's not even kept by you. It says it's reserved for you in heaven by God. And I'm glad for that because, you know, finding my cell phone sometimes is hard. <laughs> so we want to be careful. And it's not like we're looking for the devil everywhere and, and hunting for him. It's respect because he is out for your life. And it's about fearing God more than you fear the devil. And if you do that, you'll always be close to him. And you don't have to worry about walking through the valley of the shadow of death you know that the Lord will be there with you. He now tells us to be hopeful as he moves on. Steadfast in the faith is the way that we're supposed to resist him. And the way that you can stand before Satan is when you've already kneeled before God. When you come before God and you give him your life and you say, I'm going to do anything you want me to do, that is going to give you the ability to stand before the devil because in and of yourself, he, you are no match for him. You know that. Without Christ, and everything that he's done. And if it's not by the Holy Spirit, we just don't have the power. And we'll give up every time. But we're no longer slaves to those things because Christ has come into our lives and the Spirit of God now lives inside of us and keeps us doing from that which we would otherwise do. It says that knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And we talked about that last week. You know, every single thing that you and I go through in the ways that we're tempted, other people are tempted in the same ways. Mm -hmm. And yet the scripture assures us that there's no temptation that has not come upon you that's not common. In other words, it's, it's, you're not an unusual case. You know, when people say, oh, well, you don't understand. 
Okay, well, maybe I don't understand particularly, but generally I do, because I'm tempted in the same ways that you are. You might be tempted in different ways. I get tempted to smack people. <laughs> any of you? Any of you? I need to be alerted. If any of you, yes, if any of you get tempted to smack people simply because they need it, or they deserve it, or they've earned it, I, I, I sometimes still get, especially with people who drive like maniacs, I just, you know, I, I just get, I get fed up and it boils me up and I have to spend some time with the Lord. I got to pray instantly. Say, God, you got to help me here. I'm, this isn't good. This is a leftover. You know, I'm, I'm just a container of the Holy Spirit. I'm not the Holy Spirit and I'm not God. I'm just a container. And unfortunately, sometimes the Tupperware smells like the thing that was in it last. Oh, you, I mean... The best thing a container can be is clean and empty. And because we're containers, that's what we want to do. We want to contain the Spirit of God. We don't want to contaminate. So that's, that's my confession to you all. So we're all going down the same road, and we're all suffering temptation in the same way. That means a couple of really ni nice things. First of all, your situation is not unique. <laughs> So whatever it is that you're struggling with, Jesus has an answer. And there are other people that have been through what you're going through right now, and they're looking at it in the rearview mirror. There are folks that have gotten a diagnosis of cancer and that they only have months to live. What do you do with that? If you've never had that diagnosis, you don't know. How do you integrate that with your faith? How do you have a conversation with people? How do you tell your family? How do you, you know, there are things that people have gone through that you and I can learn from. And the body of Christ is such where we learn from one another. And we're all being tempted in various ways. And the beautiful thing is we can learn. Reading the Bible is so beautiful that way. I can go all the way back to Genesis and I can learn. I can learn. Oh, I didn't know that. There were things when I opened up the book of Genesis and looked at Eve and Adam and the fall and how God had put everything there and the, the trees in the middle of the garden and all of that and the orchestration of God's word and their, you know, their denial. You know, what, what is this that you've done? Well, the woman that you gave me. <laughs> wow, I, I see a tendency to want to blame others instead of take personal responsibility for your actions. Eve says, I was deceived. The serpent gave to me and, and told me I'd be like you and you're the celestial party pooper and, you know, you were trying to, you know, poop on my party. You were trying to keep something from me. God knows that if you have this, you'll be just like him. Oh my goodness. Well, there's something God is withholding from me. I realize that the devil can use that as a temptation. You know, there's something God's withholding from you. Or there's something that you don't know that, boy, if you had this special thing, man, that would be it. You'd be so much better and you wouldn't struggle with sin and everything would just be perfect. Any of you heard that lie before? You know, everybody else seems to have it together. I don't have, you know. Well, you know what? We're not all, we're not all different. We're all tempted in a lot of the same ways. We're just not that unique. We're made of the same stuff. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. So if you're struggling with something, chances are somebody else is struggling with it too. And if you've overcome it and gotten it behind you, it's your responsibility to share what God has shown you going through that to the next generation. Amen? Amen. And that's what the family of God is for. So we're going to go over this week. But may the grace, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. There's a couple of things that I get out of here. Number one, God is gracious. Can I get an amen? amen. God is gracious and he does not, he's merciful, first of all, and he withholds punishment that we deserve. And then he's gracious where he gives us something we haven't earned. God is merciful and gracious. And aren't you glad? Because we're such recipients of that, right? God is gracious. We're going to inherit eternal glory. By the way, I think the word eternal is there because it's the opposite of a little while. Because <laughs> he says, 
after you suffer for a little while, you're going to inherit eternal glory, by the way, which eternity is a long time. Whatever, how many years you get here on the earth, that's a little while. So we are going to suffer, however. And it's one of those things that it's just the truth. If, if somebody tells you otherwise, they're trying to sell you something, right? Oh, no, you'll never suffer. Never. No temptation. Nothing. You'll, you'll never be without uh, enough money to pay your bills. Oh, really? That's great. Uh, let me take a look at your books. <laughs> I'll bet you're fabricating. That's a nice word for lying. Anyway, we're going to suffer for a little while. May the God, but may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, after I'd, I don't want to hear that. You mean the Bible actually says I'm going to suffer for a while? Yeah. Yeah. How many of you are suffering for a while? Yeah. I, I put a drill bit into my finger here a few days ago. It's getting better. Thank you for your compassion. I'm going to suffer for a while. And I, I should have done worship today, but I wasn't able to. Thank God for Rocco and the rest of the guys. But uh, you're going to suffer for a while. It's just the nature of things. Complaining about it just seems to get nowhere. But I think understanding that and having, uh, you know, having your catcher's mitt up and be ready when it comes and say, okay, so I'm sick. There we go. I'm sick. That's, there I go. I, I, I put a drill bit into my finger. There we go. Okay. That's the way. So what, am I going to be surprised? Am I going to yell at God, shake my fist? Why? Or am I going to say, you know, I'm going to suffer for a little while. You have to be willing to embrace that. Otherwise, I wouldn't do anything. It's like having a baby. You know, having a baby, uh, you ladies understand what I'm talking about. I have no idea what I'm talking about. But delivering a baby, um, I remember it was said, it's like taking your top lip and pulling it up over your head. Yeah, so that's a... I, I was there for the birth of my kids. I was there for many of my grandchildren, and it never gets easier. You know, you can pump somebody full of, uh, you know, you can give them a, a shot and, and kill the pain, but it's still painful, and it's still life-changing. It's body-altering, uh, ladies, right? Yeah, I don't know about you. I never snapped back after the first one. But it's like having a child, and you know why, you know why I understand that? Because the Bible said so, and Jesus did. In John 16, 19 to 22, Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said, in a little while I will see you no more, but then after a little while I will, you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when the baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into this world. So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. So Jesus explained there's a time where he's going to go away, which is now but he will return and he's going to take us home. And then our joy is going to be forever. And so it's, it's said not just here in Peter, but Jesus demonstrates that very clearly. We are going to grieve. Things are going to be difficult. The world is going to be having a party, but we're not. And it's going to be difficult. But you got to know that joy comes in the morning. Well, he tells us to be hopeful even in the midst of our suffering. And this whole book is basically about suffering well. We're to be hopeful because suffering is going to produce four things, which he lists right here. There are other things that suffering produces, but the ones that he mentions here is Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, will perfect. Means bring to completion. It doesn't mean that you'll be perfect in this life, like a perfectionist or somebody with ADHD, you know, has to have everything perfect. And it's not that perfection. It means to be completely complete and mature. It's uh, mentioned of ripe fruit, actually, when the, when the fruit is just right for picking. It's perfect or it's right and completed. 
And you know, I don't know about you, but I still have a lot of rough edges the Lord's chiseling off of me. How about you? Um, not just physically, but I mean spiritually and emotionally and mentally and verbally. Uh, he's still in the midst of making us into the image of his son. Isn't that nice? That you'll look back maybe a year from now and say, I can't believe I was struggling with that. It's gone. It's just gone. And I, there are, I got a whole list of things that the Lord's removed out of my life from my past, and I praise God for it. Um, but there are still things that are going on. And suffering is the unique ability to iron us out some of the wrinkles and chisel off some of the rough spots and sand some of the harder spots. In fact, everything, even a great masterpiece, needs maintenance, right? This is uh, Michelangelo's David from the waist up for, for your benefit. And uh, because he's naked. If you, you guys, you guys are tough room. Even a masterpiece needs maintenance, right? I think about Jesus with his disciples at the Last Supper. And he went around after supper was over and he washed their feet. And Peter wanted a bath, and finally. He said, no, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. I know who you are, and you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I, uh, you shouldn't be washing my dirty feet. And he says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. And Peter said, okay, <laughs> let me take my clothes off. I want a bath. Let's get it all done. I'm, you know, I'll take it from top to bottom. And Jesus said, you are all clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. You just need your feet washed. There's this principle that when we come to Christ, we're made a new creation, that things are new, that he gives us a new spirit. He gives us a new mind. He gives us a new motivation. He opens our eyes so that we can see. And yet we walk through a dirty world and we get dirty feet. And even a masterpiece needs to be maintained. Uh, this is uh, those who are in Italy maintaining uh, Michelangelo's David cleaning and polishing, and they've discovered that there are some weaknesses in David's ankles so that it's starting to crumble, and uh, we may not be able to see it as you and I have seen it previously because it's actually wearing away, like all of us are. What a surprise. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do you know that the scripture says that that which God began in you, that he will continue? Because God's not a quitter, right? God's not a quitter. And he's not going to quit just so that you know. And I'm glad he will perfect you. That's his commitment to you. Number two, suffering produces an established foundation. This word established means to make stable, to place firmly, to set facts, fix firmly, to render constant, to confirm one's mind. It, uh, the original Greek word carries with it all of that context. So suffering will establish you. You say, well, what, what does that mean? Well, if you know anything about this building here on the right, this is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And the interesting thing is when they started building it, it wasn't leaning. But as they built it, it began to lean because they built it on a swamp. That's why. So they now have, you know, large steel um, cords that go up to it and they're, they're trying to right it. But of course, it's stone and it doesn't like to move. Uh, so they just basically made it safe so that, you know, you can pretend you're holding it up in a photograph and all that kind of. But you see, what, what suffering will do is it will give you a firm foundation so that you're not, you know, leaning, if you will. When you've go, gone through some difficult things and you go through something else that's not quite so difficult, you go, eh, this is nothing. Like, I don't know if you've ever fasted beyond 10 days, but the first three days is killer. You know, because I drink coffee, there's the headache, which is withdrawal from caffeine. And then there's, you're hungry, and everything smells like food. <laughs> Somebody's cutting grass, I'm suddenly hungry. It smells like vegetables. 
I mean, you, you, you know, you smell people's body odor and you go, someone's cooking meat somewhere. <laughs> you, and for three days, it's just absolutely just horrendous. After three days, it's like the whole system just shuts down. Your digestive system says, we're going to sleep. You know, like you put your, your Apple computer, sleep. There it goes. And you can go through life with, without any without any hunger pains. Uh, you still want to put stuff in your mouth. You love the taste of things, I imagine, uh, or certain things. And so you have that going on, so you've got to battle all of that. And then there's the spiritual issue where you're trying to conduct your relationship with God and uh, the weakness that you have. And I don't know about you, but if I don't put any food in the furnace, I tend to get cold because there's nothing to burn. And so you're, you know, you're doing double and triple layers and you skinny people know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm well insulated like a walrus, so I don't ever get cold. But what hardship will do is it will establish you. It will give you a firm footing to be able to conduct your life. Things that you've made up your mind about to plow through that thing and get to the other side. And God gives you grace and you learn to go to him early and often like the disciples in the boat going over the Sea of Galilee. A storm rose up. Jesus is asleep in the stern. And, you know, the fishermen think, they, I got this, you know, and they're going to take care of it until waves are starting to go over the side of the boat and they're going down. And they wake up, Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? Oh my God. I'm sleeping. What in the world? He gets up and he speaks to the wind and the waves and he says, be still. And they were. Jesus can still do that. They should have woken him up early. They should have woken him up often, not when they were at the end of their own strength. And I think that's the point for me. I need to be in a constant relationship with him of prayer and dedication and giving him all of my anxiety because he cares for me. So that's what I do. Been through some things, it will help you so that you're established. And James 5, 8 says, you also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. There's a sense in which you want to be established and settled in on this. And it's not a question that keeps coming up that you're not wrestling with it all the time, but you've been established in it. So practice makes permanent. You know, they say practice makes perfect. I don't know about that, but it makes it permanent, doesn't it? If you do it over and over, how many of you still know how to write, write cursive? How many young people have no idea what I'm talking about? Yeah, they don't teach it anymore. It's a lost art, right? And yet that practice is one of those things that makes it permanent. And it's a permanent part of who you are from then on. Something else that suffering will do is strengthen you. Strengthen is conditioned power. It's power that you get by use. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, like this guy here? Strength comes when you're exercising muscles, for instance. When you exercise them to the point of failure. That's always fun. You know, uh, I, I remember working out with a guy who used to, that was his thing. He would work to failure. And so working, working out with him was, okay, we're going to put more weight on. We're going to put more weight on. We're going to put more weight on until you can't lift it one time. And then you take a little bit of weight off. And so you're able to get it maybe two times. And then you take a little more weight off. And then you can get maybe one and a half. Until it's 20 pounds. And you can't lift 20 pounds. Isn't that great? Doesn't that sound exciting? Don't you want to embrace that? I did this one day. I went outside of the gym. And I went to go home. And I realized I had brought the motorcycle. And I was like, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> I couldn't lift 20 pounds. But I had to drive a motorcycle home. That was scary. You want to talk about trusting the Lord. It's one of those things that strength is developed as you push yourself or as God pushes you through difficulties and hardship. You go through that stuff. It develops strength. Without which, you know, you, you'd look at 20 pounds and go, oh, I can't lift that because I never lift that. <laughs> You know, that's a different situation. But I can tell you, the next day after that and the next day after that, I found I was able to do more and do more and do more. 
because when you shred yourself like that and your body has to rebuild, suddenly you have more power, you have more strength, you're conditioned for that. Um, that's why I'm so concerned about this generation because as good parents, you wanna make sure your kids have everything, right? I mean, I, I know of a parent who has a 27-year-old child who gets a $25,000 a month allowance for child support. Isn't that crazy? Nah, the, the guy's very, very rich, but he doesn't want to give his 27-year-old child support anymore because he's 27 years old. And you have this generation that thinks they're do everything and they should leech off their parents until they have no more resources and then throw them in a, in a home and forget about them. This world just does that with people because people are disposable and they love money and they use people when we should be using money and loving people. It's a very different thing. So strength is one of those things that's conditioned. And if you're not pushed and if you don't suffer and if things aren't hard for you, you will never learn to get beyond your own little comfort zone. How many of you love stepping outside your comfort zone? Three, four people. Yeah, I, I'm learning to enjoy comfort zones so much more now. The ring is getting smaller. But strength is what happens when you suffer. In Luke 22, 32 says, but I have prayed for you. This is Jesus speaking to Peter before he falls away and denies him. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Jesus is telling him, you're going to fall away, Peter. You're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. And by the way, when that happens, I want you to come back and strengthen your brothers. Like you would think, what? This guy who's a quitter is going to be able to encourage and strengthen his brothers? Yes, because he battled through all of that failure. In fact, he becomes the principal discipler of John Mark, who's a quitter on Paul. And he quits and goes home in the middle of a, a mission. And Paul says, I'm not taking him with me anymore. It's interesting that Mark ends up getting hooked up with Peter, who's a, a, a very well-known quitter, and he disciples him into being a good, strong disciple of Jesus Christ. None of that's an accident. So Jesus said, when you return, strengthen your brethren. So tearing us down very often and removing those th things of our flesh, that is what's going to make us stronger and make us more committed to the Lord so he can use us more effectively. Something else, after you suffer for a while, it will settle you. And when I read that word settle, I think, ah, oh, settled. I like that. The word actually means to, to be established, to be grounded, to be founded, much like a castle is. You know, we, we have a country where we don't really have castles because our country's not that old. But you go to Europe, you're talking thousands of years, right? So some of these things have been there for thousands of years. And you won't find any wood structures over there that have been there for a thousand years. You'll find stone structures because they're established. They're set. Those things, you can, you can say, yeah, it's uh, 23 miles west of this castle or whatever. Well, it's an established thing, and it's been there for a really long time. Suffering will produce that quality in you, where you're grounded, where things are, don't move, where things don't uh, just go away, where you're not given to highs and lows. You're, you're given to a steady medium, a trustworthy place of being founded or grounded. In Matthew 7, 25, Jesus speaking about two groups of people, those who hear these words of mine and put them into practice, I'll tell you what I will liken him unto, unto a man who built his house on a rock and dug a foundation and built his house on it. And then the wind came and the rain came and the storms beat up against the house and the house didn't fall. And yet there's another group of people, those who hear what I say and don't do what I say, I'll tell you what they're like. They're like people who took their house and they built it on the sand. They built it right on the top. 
what happens is you get some wind, you get rain, and you get force, and the house falls, and it's totally decimated. Um, building in California on a muddy slope, not a good idea. I could show you footage. It's not a good idea. And yet, there are people that still try to do it and get away with it and try to give them the lowest bid because they don't use steel girders and they don't go down to the bedrock and they don't found it on a foundation. When we do those things that Jesus instructs us to do, we are established, we're solid. And when the difficulties of life come, when the hardships come, we've been through it already, we've been through a whole bunch of things and it's like, this is nothing new and the devil's gonna try another scheme. Don't worry about it, God's got this. Amen? It means permanent, peaceful, anchored, and a level of maturity. So these are four things that suffering actually produces in us if we're willing to be taught by them. If we say, God, I realize, I realize this is your hand. You're not mad at me. You're not punishing me. You're conditioning me. And when we realize that and we say, Lord, I'm going to just trust you in this, Boy, what a difference that makes. Because then you're not striving and accusing God or, or being under condemnation. Oh, maybe I'm doing something wrong. You know, I, I knew I shouldn't have said that or done that thing. And God's mad at me. Well, none of that's true. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. Satan means accuser. And he will come and tell you that everything is your fault. That God doesn't love you. And he's mad at you. He's not because he already took all of his wrath out on his son. All of it went on Jesus. So there's nothing left for us to do but to enjoy what he's given to us as a gift. Amen? Amen. This is his closing, and I will close with this. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, that sounds like the end of the letter. But like every good preacher, he goes on. By Sylvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. And so does Mark, my son. Notice Peter calls Mark his son. He's calling him his son in the faith, if you will. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to you, all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So we got a second amen, so we know that that is the end. That's the end of the... So, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I'll tell you what. What you need to remember when you're teaching, when you're living, when you're doing anything, is life isn't about you. It's about him. It's all about him. And sometimes we forget that. And we can trip over our own feet and make a huge mistake. And sometimes I can get so into the Bible and learning everything and trying to get everything to connect that I forget it's really about him. It's not about perfection. It's not about uh, getting done with the chapter. Oh my goodness, I really fret when that happens. I get a whole chapter studied and done and I think I'm going to get it done and then I never get it done. I just seem to continue to babble on endlessly. So... I have to remember that it's all for him. And he's so gracious, right? He's willing to take whatever it is that we give to him, and he's gracious to receive it. We have to be careful we don't fall over our own feet. Proverbs sixteen eighteen says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Being careful to make sure that we don't think we're the center of the universe and everybody needs to do what we want, you know, that, that our opinion is the most important one. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I'm, I'm glad because some of you look like I'm speaking another language, like you've <laughs> never, ever had this happen. And yet here at the very end of the letter, Peter remembers, you know, it's all about him. It's all about him. It's about his glory. It's about his dominion forever and ever. Amen. And, you know, we always have to be reminded of that. Isaiah 14, 12 to 15 is an example of what not to do. It's the story of Lucifer. He says, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground. You are weakened. You have weakened the nation. For you have said in your heart, notice all the eyes. 
I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. By the way, that's the pit or, or death to the lowest depths of the pit. So that was the fall of the devil is where he was thinking about himself. And, you know, I, I, you can meet any number of people, most of them very famous or, or wealthy, who will s say statements like this. I'm, you know, I remember Muhammad Ali, I'm the greatest. You, you better be careful there, my friend. You're going to have to stand before God and he might get a little jealous of you taking his uh, title. So I don't want to take that example. I want to take the example of Peter who says, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And it's not about me. It's about the Lord. And maybe you have a plan. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe it won't. Maybe you have an idea. Maybe you think it's the greatest idea since sliced bread. It might happen. It might not happen. You have to hold it with an open hand because it's all about him really, isn't it? And learning to lay ourselves down for him is a difficult thing. So he says, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God by which you stand. The grace of God. Peter reminds them, I'm, I'm writing you this letter so you understand the true grace of God. The true grace of God by which you stand. So it's not due to any strength of your own. You remember when Peter saw the Lord walking on the water and it was in the middle of a, a, a nighttime rowing. And he said, Lord, if that's you, then ask me to come out and, and, and I will. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter gets out of the boat and he walks on water. And yet he starts to look around at the wind and the waves and he falls. He takes his eyes off of Jesus and he looks at his situation and he goes, this is impossible. And down he goes. And the Lord reaches down and pulls him back up. They get into the boat and he goes, you were doing so well. What happened? And it's interesting, he doesn't answer the question, but we all know what the answer is. He took his eyes off Jesus. And he started to say, this is impossible, I can't do this. Well, guess what? You have exactly what you said. And down you go. So there he was. The grace of God is the thing that causes us to stand. And when we think it's us, we're, we're working for the wrong person. Galatians 2, 20 to 21 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died in vain. You see, there are two laws. Either you can try to be good enough for God by all that you do, or you could depend upon the righteousness of Christ. That's the only way to heaven, really, isn't it? You can stand before God on the basis of your good works, but then you're going to also have to take the bad into consideration, aren't you? Because then Christ did not die for you. And so it's the grace of God that causes us to stand. And any ability, any gift, anything that you have is God's grace to you. Amen? Amen. And we need to give him glory for that. Or Jesus died in vain if we put ourselves on that throne. Hebrews 12, 15, we're exhorted by the author, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. What he's talking about is make sure that you're in the faith. Make sure that you're doing the right things and the grace of God is in your life. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. So he says, make sure that you're in the grace of God and one of the evidences of it is that you don't have bitterness. Because if you have bitterness, it's a contaminant. It's like cancer in your soul, right? Right but it's one of those things that you can give away and it's a contaminant. So make sure that you're in the grace of God, that, you're, that you've received it fully and that you understand it completely or else you could have a root of bitterness that rises up in your heart and that, that displays that you have fallen short of the grace of God. He says, she who is Babylon elect together with you greets you. Now, if, if you're a scholar, 
you'll say, what in the world is this thing with Babylon? Well, some people believe that Peter wrote this from Babylon. I don't believe that's what he's referring to. We have no uh, indication that there's a church in Babylon, that there are believers there, that there's a congregation of saints there. I believe he is referring to it in a euphemistic sense to Rome. Rome, who to them was Babylon because they worshipped all these false deities and they were the center of all all the activity for the Romans in Jerusalem. I believe he's talking about Rome, and we know that Peter actually loses his head later on in Rome, just outside of Rome. He's uh, oh, he not lose his head, that's Paul. He was crucified upside down. And so I believe he's referring to Babylon, meaning at this point Rome. You'll see that there's Babylon also in Revelation. Um, it, it talks about spiritual Babylon, so I don't want to get into a whole exegetical thing, but I think he's probably talking about those who are in Rome, who there's a church in Rome. He talks about Sylvanus and Mark, and he talks about these two people in ministry. By the way, if you ever get an opportunity for somebody to pat you on the back and say thank you for all that you've done, something you need to remember is the people that helped you, right? Because it does, it, it's never one person doing anything. It's a team. I mean, even on a Sunday morning, my goodness, there were, there were men who cleaned the toilets, who were, who were spackling the walls yesterday, who did all manner of upgrades and things. There are people working behind the scenes on video and sound and all of these things. There, there's this huge group of people. There are people preparing food for all of you. There are people who brought food for all of you. I praise God for everybody that's involved. There are people teaching children right now, telling them the gospel on their level. There are all of these things happening inside this building. And, you know, people will come to me and say, oh, I love your church. I'm one part. I happen to be a very visible part. But I don't ever want to forget the people that are, are helping and supporting, right? So if anybody ever praises you for anything and there was somebody helping you, make sure you remember them. You don't ever want to be the only person standing up and taking any credit. And so I, I love that Peter's doing that here. He's remembering his coworkers, and he's giving kind of a shout out for Mark, his son, he calls him, uh, because Mark doesn't have a really great reputation. And Peter's kind of pulling him in, and he says, this guy's with me, you know, so don't pick on him. I, I love that fact. It also says to greet one another with the kiss of love. So you see that coming at you on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Kissing was a, a, a common greeting back then. Actually, the Romans made it illegal at some point because there was a herpes outbreak. And uh, they were passing it along to everyone. So they made it illegal for you to kiss in public. But, you know, they did the, the like the French do. You know, they grab you by the face and they give you one on each cheek. So that was a common greeting back then. So uh, what, what we do here is hugging, and I think that's probably okay. I, I don't think I'm going to go to hell because I don't greet everyone with a kiss. But I want you to notice that it's a kiss of love. Then another place in Scripture, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, so that, you know, some of you single guys don't go, all right. <laughs> okay. The Scripture says it. Come here. Come over here. There, there are always a few that are always kissing the pretty girls, but uh, won't even greet anybody else. Um, not here, of course, no. But <laughs> I've been places where it's like that. Um, and it doesn't mean like this. <laughs> that kind of kiss is right out, just in case you were wondering. And then he says, peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So that concludes First Peter. Guess what we're doing next week? Oh, you got it. <laughs> You think you know something. <laughs> actually, we are. We're going to go into Second Peter, which is Peter's last letter before he's actually crucified upside down. Last words of people are very important, especially when they see the end coming. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up at this point, and uh, we're going to sing another song for you. Next week, as we get into Second Peter, we're going to see his swan song. And he's going to explain some things to us that are important that you might do if it was your last letter to somebody. I wonder if you'll 
take the exercise up sometime to write a letter to someone that you love as though it were the last thing that you would write. You might find things pouring out of your heart that you never knew were there. So we'll talk about that next week.